Our lectionary passage this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, a few verses from the seventh chapter. Listen, hear, and receive God's word for us. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Jesus said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain they do worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandments of God and hold to human tradition. Then Jesus called the crowd again to him and said, Listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceitfulness, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. You have heard me say before, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. You all have heard me say many times before that sometimes we can be so heavenly bound that we are no earthly good. In other words, we can be so focused on what we perceive to be the things of God are so eager to emulate our own personal brand of righteousness that we fail to be the righteousness of God. You see, the righteousness of God extends and seeks justice for and the inclusion of people who are marginalized, oppressed, or treated unjustly. The righteousness of God extends radical hospitality and acceptance to people whose society seeks to exclude, demonize, or ostracize. The righteousness of God extends forgiveness, grace, mercy, and love to all of God's people, including people whom society seeks to define as flawed, worthless, or insignificant. Consider the Pharisees and the scribes who in their meeting with Jesus expressed disdain for his disciples' lack of ceremonial hand washing. They were so caught up in their own brand of righteousness their Jewish cleanliness rituals. In in stark contrast, Jesus, the embodiment of God's love and forgiveness, he broke all ceremonial cleanliness rules. Jesus was known to break those rules of purity, allowing himself to be surrounded by and laying his hands on and curing people who were physically, mentally, and spiritually ill. Jesus allowed himself to be touched by those who were ritualistically unclean. And he even hung out with people who lived on the margins of society in his day. Jesus' reputation of healing the sick and raising the dead, feeding the hungry, welcoming the outcasts, and traveling from town to time with his disciples as people followed him, seeking to be healed and restored into proper society, was well known. So when the Pharisees and the scribes showed up, they obviously came with an agenda to accuse Jesus and his disciples of something, anything to discredit them, to distract from the good they were doing and accuse them of being anything other than sent by God to the people. Now before we start pointing fingers at the scribes and the Pharisees, it is crucial that we examine ourselves and acknowledge that we too are guilty of our own brand of religiosity that excludes and accuses. When there is a change in liturgy or in the music or songs are not familiar in worship, when someone sits in our seat, when a person comes into worship whom we deemed are not dressed appropriately 
or may not be physically clean, we are quick to determine that something is wrong with the worship service or that person should clean themselves up in order to come to worship. After all, cleanliness is next to godliness. Amen. But it pays to get a little dirty sometimes. Well, I declare that it is in the places that are dirty, unclean, and messy that Jesus did his best evangelistic work. It was in those places where God appeared to be absent that we are called to as well. Into the highways and byways, among the lost, the least, and the left behind, is where the Spirit of God is calling us to be the righteousness of God. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders began when they noticed that the disciples were eating bread without ritualistically washing their hands. The Pharisees and scribes claimed all Jews follow the tradition of the elders by washing their hands thoroughly before eating. Commentator Elizabeth Webb writes, the claim that all Jews follow the same tradition is an overstatement. The mere fact that only some of the disciples did not wash their hands before eating tells us that not all Jews followed the same practice. The tradition of the elders refers to oral interpretations of the Mosianic law, which the Pharisees and scribes considered authoritative. The Pharisees and scribes continued to pile on and declare that Jews do not eat anything from the marketplace without washing it as well. That was before the day of pesticides. When what they were really saying is that a person should not eat after coming from the marketplace without purifying themselves, as they may have encountered or been in contact with others who were unclean. This assertion directly attacks Jesus and his ministry of healing the people who were sick and infirmed in the marketplaces as described in chapter 6. Webb continues, the reference to the market is another example of Mark's subtle way of calling our attention to what really matters. For Jesus to heal them demonstrates the inbreaking of the kingdom of God in the world. End of quote. What really matters is not that we may unknowingly brush up against or come in contact with people who are sick, have imperfect hygiene, or do not follow our traditions or practices really doesn't matter at all. What really matters is that when we do, because we most certainly will, we are to share the love of God with them, to accept them where they are and trust that our chance encounters will not only benefit them, but will also help us grow spiritually. Because in them, we may have had an encounter with God. Jesus said, as much as you have done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. Pointing out Jesus' disciples' failure to follow the Jewish laws of cleanliness or not living according to the traditions of the elders is in essence an indictment against Jesus and his leadership. It supposes that Jesus considers himself to be above the law. However, the Pharisees and scribes will soon discover that Jesus came not to usurp but to fulfill the law. Summarily so dismissing their foolishness, Jesus changes the direction of the conversation and quotes a passage from the book of Isaiah. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, he says. Jesus calls them hypocrites because they abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Jesus' response is not a criticism of the scribes and Pharisees' adherents, to empty worship practices, he condemns their distortion of Jewish tradition to circumvent the law. Jesus is not rejecting the law. He rebukes them for failing to uphold the law's intent or to confuse their understanding of holiness with God's deeper purposes. Jesus had just fed over 5,000 people in a deserted place in chapter 6. And I am confident, confident that no one stopped to wash their hands during that meal, much less ritualistically because they were in a dirty place, deserted place where people were fed spiritually and physically. I don't recall anyone raising questions about feeding the people gathered to hear Jesus being to hear Jesus and to be healed. The real issue is not about the ritual 
hand washing before a meal are the traditions that Jesus and his disciples failed to follow. The real problem of the day that Jesus brought to the religious folks' attention was the state or condition of human hearts, of their hearts. Jesus turns his admonition to everyone gathered there, the people that he has just healed, the people who brought them to him, teaching those who may have more receptive hearts that it is not the things you consume or that enter a person from the outside or externally that make you impure, but the things that come out from their insides. Those are the things that defile us and make us unclean. Don Wilhelm writes, this sermon in a sentence is both provocative and innovative. Jesus speaks with prophetic authority, announcing a new word, even as he enacts the new understanding of holiness. Then he pronounces the things that come out of the human heart that cause us to be unclean. In effect, Jesus is saying that sin is a matter of the heart and our will, not a violation of the laws of purity. Jesus lists actions and problems that harm our neighbors and ourselves and are offensive to God. I didn't list those things. You go back and read them. Wilhelm continues to state, here Jesus pushes his hearers to consider defilement or impurity as a matter of personal sin that has social impact. It separates us from others. It separates us from God when we judge others according to our standards rather than according to the love of God. The heart of holiness is not a matter of ritual purity, of distancing oneself from objects, food, or persons believed to be unclean. It is a matter of the will to love God and to love our neighbor as we are loved unconditionally, unconditionally, without any precepts about what is right or wrong or indifferent, just to love. In my estimation, all of this is much ado about very little or close to nothing. And it is a matter of misplaced priorities. As a point of personal confession, I must just share that when God gives me a sermon, I preach it to myself first. And this sermon in particular convicted me. It did. Now, how it convicted me is between me and God. <laughs> Not going to share that with you. Just pray for you, Pastor. But I declare that when we place policies, polity, personal preferences, or precepts over people, we have misplaced priorities. When we are concerned about following traditions or holding fast to our personal truisms or viewpoints or way of worship, hmm, we have misplaced priorities. When we are so strident in our beliefs, our dogma, and our philosophies over new and innovative ways of being the church, the people, and the people of God, we have misplaced priorities. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. We are guilty of misplacing priorities. The only priority that we should practice continually, excellently, without ceasing, is love. Love. Love for God. Love for others. Love for ourselves. Love. And throw in a little grace and mercy sometimes. And forgiveness. But most of all, love. Susan read earlier from the first chapter of James. And Sarah taught the kid, children that every good and perfect gift comes from God. And the most perfect gift is love. God calls us to be doers of the word, not merely hearers who deceive ourselves. 
For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away, immediately they forget what they were like. We forget that we have been those people on the margins sometimes. We forget that we have been unclean sometimes. We forget that we have been dirty and unloving. We forget those things because it's easy to forget when we're thinking about ourselves and judging others. But James continues, but those who look into the perfect law, the law of purity and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they are blessed in their doing. When we have righteousness, just and loving priorities, we remember who we are. And we remember whose we are. And we remember that those that we judge differently belong to God too. It's time for us to get our priorities right. Start loving on people. Start loving on ourselves. And most of all, love God. May it be so. Amen.